What ethical concerns arise when using visual data from body cameras, CCTV or mobile phones? What issues arise with data that is openly accessible to anyone on the internet? And how can reviewers and interested readers of online video data publications assess a study's ethical standing? We want to share some reflections on research ethics in 21st century video data. We we'll introduce five aspects in ethics debates in the social sciences and apply them to novel types of second-hand video data. As we've heard throughout this workshop, since the early 2000s, the proliferation of cameras in devices such as mobile phones, CCTV, or body cameras has led to a sharp increase in video recordings of human behavior. These are second-hand video data that usually other people have filmed and researchers were never in contact with those filming, let alone those being filmed. Therefore, second-hand and online video data provide great potential for social science research, but they also raise novel ethical questions. There are general ethics guidelines that we can apply, and there are specific ethics insights in different fields, such as participant observation, offline visual studies, and videography, as well as non-online video research. But there are few specific ethics guidelines on this type of new 21st century um, video data, which is often secondhand, often capturing real life situations. Nico and I wrote a paper entitled YouTube, Google, Facebook, 21st Century Online Video Data and Research Ethics last year, in which we proposed some aspects to consider when evaluating in particular online video research studies. But now we want to go through existing aspects discussed in general research ethics guidelines to develop a vocabulary to think about ethics in different types of 21st century video data. From research on ethical standards, we see several criteria we think are worthwhile discussing. These are informed consent, privacy, unique opportunities, transparency, and minimizing harm to participants. These notions are often mentioned in ethics literature, and it is often mentioned that they should be applied during the entire research process, including field access, data collection, analysis, and presentation of the findings. However, these principles are not binding, and they are often defined by changing consensus. They differ depending on the national context as well, referring to the legal basis as well as the assessment of ethics. Further, since different ethical principles tend to contradict each other in practice, ethical areas and principles should always be evaluated in relation to each other and weighted against each other in the context of a specific study. So let's briefly reflect on each of them in the light of 21st century video data. First, informed consent. Informed consent means a person's personality rights and rights to informational self-determination are guaranteed. In practice, this means that people should know they are being researched, they should receive relevant information on the planned research in a comprehensible format, and they should then voluntarily agree to participate or decline to do so. If we film people, for instance, during experiments, we can and have to ask them for consent. But if we use video filmed at a public event, or if we use video data uploaded online, getting consent becomes difficult to obtain because we can usually not ask people that have been filmed. Some researchers then would go ahead and say, without consent, you should not do a study. And this is certainly an issue that is problematic to users of second-hand video data, we think. Other scholars would say we need to assess the project overall. So we also need to assess the other relevant areas to see if we should or should not do a certain study. Privacy is a second key concern that we think can also be problematic for 21st century video data. Privacy means filmed information does not become public or accessible to people it was not intended for, and people in the footage are not identifiable. So our first question here is obviously what is private or public? An ethics guideline state that information is private when an individual can reasonably expect that information will not be made public with personal identifiers. So we could say behavior in public places that is captured on CCTV, 
um, on police body cameras, etc., as well as information that is accessible without constriction on the internet, may therefore be fair game for social science researchers, even if they don't have consent, because these would by definition be public. We would however argue that the situation is not that simple. First, because people depicted in a video may not be aware of or consent to a video being posted online. The phenomenon of so-called revenge porn is an example illustrating this point. Second, even if the depicted person has uploaded the video, this does not mean from an ethical perspective that a researcher is entitled to use it as data for a social science research project. The notion of contextual integrity suggested by Helen Nissenbaum may therefore be more useful than the notion of privacy, we think. Contextual integrity means that people have the right to control the flow of information on their person and that taking information out of its original context and use it for research may violate that right. In order to assess contextual integrity, we may, for instance, reflect on what is depicted as well as where it is uploaded. So what is depicted, for instance, a private event or a public event? Is it a family dinner or is it a pro public protest? Where is it uploaded? Um, for instance, Facebook versus YouTube. Facebook is usually much more private compared to YouTube that is much more public. These two aspects, consent and privacy, we think can pose a concern for 21st century video data. But we also have two key ethical principles that we think are strongly favorable to using 21st century video data. One of these is unique opportunities. Unique opportunities means if a method offers exceptional potential for social science research, this may outweigh some ethical concerns. And we think 21st century video data may offer such potential for some research questions. Video data in general may provide unique analytic potential to study either specific microprocesses or to study specific events that we might otherwise have no access to. For instance, the situational dynamics of robberies are almost impossible to study in any other way than analyzing CCTV footage. We might interview people, but it's unlikely that they can recall situational dynamics we might do participant observation, but it's unlikely that during that participant observation, a robbery will happen. So CCTV footage, for instance, uploaded on YouTube, such as I used in my um, 2018 study on how robberies succeed or fail, might provide unique opportunities to study such types of research questions. With data uploaded online, we might uh, also have them being very cost effective. Um, we might uh, also have quite low reactivity in video data if people did not notice they were being filmed. So all of these may lead to unique opportunities to study a certain phenomenon. And this might be an ethical argument favorable to many studies using these types of video data. Transparency is a fourth concern and another aspect in which secondhand video data has favorable properties, we argue. Transparency refers to making goals, procedures, and data as accessible as possible to other researchers and the public. It is a key issue in research ethics and methodology because it improves reproducibility and openness of scientific processes and findings. Video data holds unique potential for transparency of research um, because multiple researchers can analyze the same raw data. And this obviously allows testing and decoder reliability and it thereby increases reproducibility of the findings. For example, Isabel Bransen in her publication on the Arab Spring, myself in my publication on protest violence and robberies, provide links to all raw data analyzed. So everyone who is reading the paper, um, other researchers, um, readers, reviewers, can check the raw data firsthand and can assess the analysis. So in terms of transparency, 21st century video data shows very favorable characteristics. Minimizing harm is a fifth and crucial concern. Minimizing harm holds that people who participate in research should ideally not be subject to harm or disadvantage due to the study being conducted, or we need to think about how harm can be minimized. One way to attain this in video data is obviously anonymization. But for instance, in online videos, anonymization is often not possible, especially when using YouTube links. Researchers are not even legally allowed to download 
videos from YouTube, let alone blur faces and then upload the video again. If anonymization is not possible, we think it is key to reflect on the depicted content and the context in order to assess minimizing harm. For instance, how deviant or embarrassing is the behavior that is captured? If a video shows mundane, inconspicuous behavior, we can expect that the study and dissemination of the video in scientific formats is less problematic for the depicted individual. But even if behavior may be criminal or embarrassing, let's say, we may assess harm by reflecting on further dissemination of the video through our research. If, for instance, a video of a robbery has been watched 4 million times on YouTube, further dissemination through research may be minimal. At the same time, if the video was uploaded for, by law enforcement, let's say a robbery video was uploaded by law enforcement, then further harm through dissemination for the person that is involved in criminal behavior is unlikely. But obviously, if only 20 people have clicked on a YouTube video that you want to analyze and it depicts, let's say, protesters that are protesting a repressive regime, then research is more likely to potentially cause further harm to the filmed individuals. And this is something that needs to be considered. These are five key aspects in social science ethics that we see as particularly relevant to 21st century video data. Some of these aspects might directly pull into different directions. For instance, confidentiality and transparency. Maximizing confidentiality would suggest that a video might be pixelated, for instance, or not to be shared with readers. But at the same time, maximizing transparency requires that readers can trace the analysis. Uh, and this is difficult if the key features have been rendered useless for analysis because of anonymization. The five aspects also differ depending on the data type, obviously. So the potential for transparency might be higher in online data, but minimizing harm might be easier to achieve if you film experiments. And this is also something to consider. We try to develop a list of criteria that can help assess studies based on these criteria. And ideally, we think you can weigh each study by assessing where a study stands on each of these areas discussed, and then weigh each area against each other. For instance, in my robbery study, where you see CTV of robberies uploaded on YouTube, I would um, rank it low in consent and privacy, but high in unique opportunities and transparency, and fairly high in minimizing harm. Researchers may then weigh specific aspects more or less strongly. You might say that transparency is very important to you, or that confidentiality is highly important to you. Or researchers may also consider a low score in one of the areas as a reason not to conduct the study at all, regardless of all the other aspects, or a high score in one other area as a reason to conduct the study in any case, regardless of um, other aspects. We think the gray area, the ethical gray area is often quite broad, especially because so far no strict standards have been established. So each aspect needs to be assessed with care. And these choices are for each researcher to make and justify, we think. But it is fruitful to make such decisions based on an informed and transparent evaluation of ethical concerns, as for example presented here. We are very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on ethics and to hearing your questions. Thank you.